the anatomy of the eye for the non-ionizing radiation imaging and informatics module presented by Peter Walker Birch. This video on the anatomy of the eye has been created for the non-ionizing radiation imaging and informatics module at Teesside University. The anatomy of the eye is a new addition to this module following the revalidation of the BSc in diagnostic radiography in 2015. The rationale is to introduce you to those aspects of human anatomy that are not taught in the anatomy module in the first year of the course, namely the eye, the ear and the skin. These organs are important in the non-ionising radiation imaging and informatics module given that this module looks at, amongst other things, the safety aspects of non-ionising radiation that particularly affect the ear, eye and the skin particularly in relation to lights, lasers, ultraviolet, infrared radiation and sound. In this video we will look at the gross anatomy of the eye. We will look at the layers of the eye and the chambers that make up the eyeball and their function. We will also look at how light enters the eye and is focused onto the retina, which is important for image formation. In addition, uh, we will briefly outline the functions of the extraocular muscles and the muscles of the iris. Uh, we will also take a brief look at the uh, photoreceptor cells of the retina and the mechanisms that can cause damage to the retina. Uh, you should note that the content of this video and the accompanying PowerPoint may form the basis of examination questions uh, for this particular module. The layers of the eyeball. The eye is the organ of sight which is situated in the orbital cavity and is supplied by the optic nerve. It is nearly spherical in shape and is approximately 2.5 centimetres in diameter. Only one sixth of its total surface area is exposed, with the remaining area recessed and protected uh, by the orbit into which it is situated. From a structural perspective, the two eyes are separate. However, some of the activities of the eye are coordinated so that both eyes function as a pair, for example, binocular vision. It is still possible to see with one eye, however, the three-dimensional vision is impaired, particularly in relation to the judging of distances. There are three layers of tissue in the walls of the eye. The first layer is the outer fibrous layer also known as the fibrous tunic, which is made up of the sclera, which is this structure here, and the cornea, which is this structure here. The second layer is the middle vascular layer, also known as the uveal tract, or the vascular tunic, which is made up of the iris, seen here, the ciliary body, which is this structure here, and the choroid, which is this uh, pink looking structure here. The third layer is the inner nervous tissue layer, which is also known as the retina, which is this yellow structure here. Now the fibrous tunic is the uh, superficial layer of the eyeball and consists of the, the anterior cornea and the posterior sclera. The sclera, from the Greek skleros meaning hard, is what is known as the white of the eye. It is a dense layer of connective tissue made up of collagen fibres and fibroblasts. It covers the entire eyeball with the exception of the cornea, which is transparent. It has a number of functions. It gives shape to the eye, it makes the eye more rigid. It protects the inner parts of the eye and is used as a site of attachment uh, for the extraocular or extrinsic eye muscles. The sclera is um, perforated posteriorly by the optic nerve, this optic nerve which is uh, perforating the sclera there. as well as the sensory motor nerves and blood vessels of the eyeball. 
Now the cornea is a curved, transparent membrane that allows light to pass through the cornea to focus light onto the retina. Now the curved nature of the cornea is what makes it possible to focus light on the retina. The cornea is avascular, which means that it is supplied with nutrients through uh, tear fluid, also known as aqueous humour, and not through the blood vessels. The vascular tunic, or uvea, is the middle layer of the eyeball. It is composed of three parts, the choroid, the ciliary body, and the iris. Which is all that pink structure there. The choroid is highly vascularized and is the posterior portion of the vascular tunic. It lines the majority of the internal surface of the sclera. It has numerous blood vessels that provide nutrients to the posterior surface of the retina. Okay, the posterior surface of the retina. The choroid also contains melanocytes that produce the pigment melanin, which causes the choroid to appear dark brown in colour. Now the melanin absorbs stray light rays, which prevents reflections and scattering of light within the eyeball. This means that the image cast on the retina by the uh, cornea and the lens remains sharp and clear. Albinos lack melanin in all parts of the body, including the eye. This means that light gets scattered within the eyeball. Albinos often have to wear sunglasses, even indoors, as even moderately bright light is perceived as a bright glare as a result of the light scattering. The ciliary body is the anterior continuation of the choroid, which is made up of ciliary muscle. It gives attachment to the suspensory ligaments, also known as the zonular fibres, which at the other end is attached to the capsule enclosing the lens of the eye. It is the contraction and relaxation of the ciliary muscle within the ciliary body that changes the thickness of the lens, which then bends or refracts the light entering the eye to focus the image onto the retina. The ciliary body, like the choroid, appears dark brown in colour because it contains melanin-producing melanocytes. The iris is the coloured portion of the eyeball and is often likened to a flattened donut. It is named after the Greek goddess Iris, who was the personification of the rainbow. Uh, and this is meant to reflect the many colours of the, of the eye. The inner nervous tissue, that is the retina, this is that yellow structure here, uh, this lines the posterior three quarters of the eyeball. It is the start of the visual pathway. The anatomy of the retina can be examined through the use of an ophthalmoscope, which is an instrument that shines light into the eye through the pupil and allows an observer to peer through to see a magnified image of the retina, its blood supply, as well as the, the optic nerve. And you can see the optic nerve here and the blood supply here. Structures of the eyeball. You can see more clearly in this 3D representation of the eyeball, the three layers of the eyeball. The sclera, which you will recall is the white of the eye. The choroid, which is the vascularized part of the uh, eyeball. And the retina, which just lies underneath the choroid there. As mentioned in the previous slide, the ciliary body is the anterior continuation of the choroid, which is made up of ciliary muscle. It is the ciliary muscle that controls the shape of the lens for viewing close and distant objects, which we will discuss later in the presentation. The ora serrata is the serrated, i.e. a jagged edge or saw-like 
junction uh, between the retina and the ciliary body. This junction marks the transition um, from the simple non-photosensitive area of the retina into the complex multi-layered photosensitive region of the retina. The canal of Schlem is where the aqueous humor of the anterior and posterior chambers of the eye drain into and this will be discussed in a little more detail later in the presentation. The vitreous humour, which is this sort of transparent looking orb with inside the eyeball, is a transparent gelatinous substance that helps to maintain the shape of the eye, which will also be discussed later in the presentation. This is uh, another view, uh, a more lateral view of the eyeball, uh, where again you can see the three layers of the eyeball, the sclera, the choroid and the retina and you can probably more fully see the vitreous body which we discussed very briefly in the previous slide. Uh, you can also clearly see the aura serrata um, which are part of the ciliary muscles as well as the iris and you can just make out there the transparent cornea. This is a more postural medial 3D representation of the eyeball. Now in blue there you can see the ciliary processes uh, which are folds or protrusions on the internal surface of the ciliary body. Now they contain blood capillaries that secrete uh, aqueous humour, the transparent watery liquid that nourishes the lens and the cornea. Now this is a close-up of the zonular fibres uh, which you can see here in blue. Now the zonular fibres or the zonules of zin as they are also known as play an important part in changing the shape of the lens uh, along with the ciliary muscles which are here um, and these change the refractive power of the lens when viewing objects close up or from a distance. Looking at the fundus view of the right eyeball, as when viewed through an ophthalmoscope, there are a number of anatomical features that should be noted. The optic disc is a site where the optic nerve exits the eyeball. The optic nerve is bundled together with the central retinal artery, a branch of the ophthalmic artery, and the central retinal vein here in blue. Now the ophthalmic arteries are the blood vessels of the circulatory system that supply oxygenated blood to the eyes. The ophthalmic arteries arise from the internal carotid artery and pass into the orbit, or the eye socket, through the optic canal. Now branches of the ophthalmic artery supply the orbit, the muscles and the bulb of the eye, including the sclera, retina and the choroid. Now the retina, which is all this area here, is the innermost layer of the wall of the eye. Now the retina lines about three quarters of the eyeball. It is thickest posteriorly and thins out anteriorly, ending just behind the ciliary body. It is extremely delicate and is especially adapted for stimulation by light rays. It is composed of several layers of nerve cell bodies and their axons. Now these lie on a pigmented layer, a sheet of melanin coating uh, epithelial cells which attach it to the choroid. The layer that is highly sensitive to light is the layer of sensory cells, the rods and cones, which we will discuss in the next slide. Now in the centre of the posterior portion of the retina is the macula lutea, which is this area here. It is an oval shaped pigmented uh, area near the centre of the retina. It is responsible for the sharp detailed central vision. In the centre of the macula lutea is a small depression known as the fovea centralis. Now this consists of only cone shaped photoreceptors and is therefore the area with the highest visual resolution or visual acuity. Interestingly, though, there were no blue cones in the fovea centralis, only red and green. 
and we'll discuss these a little bit later on in the presentation. The arteries and veins of the eyeball. The ophthalmic arteries are the blood vessels of the circulatory system that supply oxygenated blood to the eyes. The ophthalmic arteries arise from the internal carotid artery and pass into the orbit, the eye socket, through the optic canal. Branches of the ophthalmic artery supply the orbit, the muscles and the bulb of the eye, including the sclera, retina and the choroid. It is the central retinal artery, seen here in red, that you can visualise when viewing the fundus of the eye through an ophthalmoscope, as seen in a previous slide. The ophthalmic veins are the blood vessels of the circulatory system that drain deoxygenated blood from the eyes. They include two main veins, the superior ophthalmic vein and the inferior ophthalmic vein that drain into the cavernous sinus within the head. It is the central retinal vein, seen here in blue, that you can visualise when viewing the fundus of the eye through an ophthalmoscope, again as we have seen in a previous slide. This is another view of the ophthalmic arteries. You can see more clearly in this posterior inferior view that the central retinal artery, here in red, and the central retinal vein pass into the eyeball through the optic canal or the optic nerve, uh, which is where you should be able to visualise them using an ophthalmoscope. You can see in this view the light blue coloured structure, uh, which is the left cavernous sinus. The right cavernous sinus is highlighted with this black arrow. The cavernous sinuses are situated on either side of the sphenoid bone here and receive the deoxygenated blood from the superior and inferior ophthalmic veins. These sinuses uh, empty through other sinuses into the internal jugular vein. The chambers of the eyeball. There are three chambers within the eyeball. These are the anterior chamber, the posterior chamber, and the vitreous chamber. The main posterior cavity of the eye, which is situated behind the lens, is called the vitreous chamber. Within the vitreous chamber is the vitreous humor, or vitreous body as it's also known. Now the vitreous humour is a transparent gelatinous substance that occupies about four-fifths of the eyeball. It plays an important role in maintaining the shape of the eyeball as well as ensuring the retina is pinned to the back of the eye against the choroid. Holding the retina, which is uh, seen here, so holding the retina against the choroid, which is the uh, this little uh, pinky area, is essential for ensuring an even surface for the reception of clear images. If the vitreous humour shrinks, as it does in the older person, then the retina can become detached from the choroid and needs to be reattached using a laser. Unlike the aqueous humour, which is in the anterior and posterior chambers, the vitreous humour does not undergo constant replacement. It is formed during embryonic life and consists of mostly water and collagen fibres and hyaluronic acid. It also contains cells, phagocytic cells, that remove debris, ensuring the vitreous humour is clear for unobstructed vision. However, collections of debris may cast a shadow over the retina and create the appearance of uh, specks of dust that dart in and out of the uh, visual field. These are called floaters or vitreal floaters which are common in the older person. They are normally harmless and do not require treatment. The vitreous humour uh, is enclosed within a, a fine membrane called the hyaloid membrane and this helps to form the hyaloid canal which you can just barely see through there 
which is a narrow channel that runs through the vitreous humor from the optic disc to the posterior aspect of the lens. Now, the anterior chamber, which is here, lies between the cornea and the iris. The posterior chamber lies between the iris, the zonular fibres and the lens. Both the anterior and posterior chambers are filled with aqueous humour. This is a transparent watery liquid that nourishes the lens and the cornea. Aqueous humour continually filters out of the blood capillaries in the ciliary processes of the ciliary body. It then flows forward from the ciliary body into the posterior chamber, through the zonular fibres and in front of the lens. It then travels through the pupil into the anterior chamber of the eye. From here, the aqueous humour passes through the trabecular network, sorry, trabecular meshwork and leaves the eye down the canal of Schlem and into the blood supply. Normally aqueous humour is replaced on average every 90 minutes. This is another cross-sectional view of the eye but in close-up. You can clearly see the three chambers of the eye in relation to the, the lens, the zonular fibres uh, labelled here as suspensory ligaments the ciliary body and the cornea. So as you can see there we have the posterior chamber, the anterior chamber and both of those are, are normally referred to as the anterior cavity and then we have this posterior cavity, uh, the vitreous chamber. You can also see the canal of Schlem into which the aqueous humour drains through the trabecular meshwork there. The iris muscles. The iris is the coloured portion of the eyeball and as we've said before it's often likened to a flattened donut. Uh, we also said it was named after the Greek goddess Iris who is the personification of the rainbow. Uh, this is because the name is meant to reflect the many different colours of the eye. Now the iris is suspended between the cornea and the lens and is attached at its outer margin to the ciliary processes. Its function is to provide an adjustable aperture to control the amount of light that enters the eye. Now the pupil is a, a circular opening in the centre of the iris that allows light to enter the eye. The dilation and contraction of the iris in response to levels of light controls the size of the pupil. When light levels are high, the iris contracts and the pupil becomes smaller. This limits the amount of light passing through the iris. When the light is dim, the iris relaxes, i.e. dilates, allowing more light through. This is similar to the way in which the aperture of a camera works. Now the dilation and contraction of the iris is achieved using two muscles that sit within the iris itself. These muscles are the pupillary dilator or the radial muscle, which is this large orangey coloured muscle here, and the pupillary sphincter or the circular muscle, which is this smaller pinkish circle here. As you can see on this cross section and close up of the iris, the pupillary sphincter the circular muscle can be seen near to the periphery of the iris. With the pupillary dilator or the radial muscle lining the posterior aspect of the iris. Now as you can see in this slide, bright light stimulates the parasympathetic neurons that cause the circular muscle, the pupillary sphincter of the iris to contract. This causes the pupil to constrict and decreases the amount of light that can enter the eye. Dim light, on the other hand, stimulates the sympathetic neurons that cause the radial muscles, that's these muscles here, 
or the pupillary dilator, as they're also known, of the iris to contract. This causes the pupil to dilate and increase the amount of light that enters the eye. This is a clear view of the iris muscles in this 3D eyeball with light entering through the pupil. Now in this diagram you can see that the pupillary sphincter it was a sp This is a clearer view of the iris muscles in this 3D eyeball with the light entering through the pupil. Now the pupillary sphincter the circular muscle is responding to the increase in light by constricting itself to decrease the amount of light that enters the eye. The extrinsic extraocular eye muscles. There are four rectus or straight muscles um, in the eye as well as two oblique muscles. The medial rectus muscle, which is here, rotates the eyeball inwards, i.e. medially. The lateral rectus muscle, as you can see here, rotates the eyeball outwards, laterally. So as you can see, the nose must be here for this to be medial and for this to be lateral. So this is obviously the right eye. The superior rectus muscle rotates the eyeballs upwards. So you can see the superior rectus muscle there. And the inferior rectus muscle rotates the eyeball downwards, that is inferiorly. Now the superior oblique muscle, which you can see here, uh, which is probably better demonstrated on the lateral. Here rotates the eyeball downwards and outwards. The inferior oblique rotates the eyeball upwards. So it's the inferior oblique. Rotates the eyeball upwards and outwards. Basic image formation. Now the eye is often likened to a camera when it comes to image formation. The optical elements of the eye help to focus the light from an object onto a light sensitive film, in inverted commas, i.e. the retina, whilst also ensuring that the correct amount of light enters the eye for the pupil to create an exposure. Now, our, now there are three processes that we need to examine in order to be able to understand how the eye forms a clear image of an object on the retina. The first is refraction or bending of the light by the lens and the cornea. Two is accommodation, that is the change in shape of the lens. And three, the constriction and narrowing of the pupil. Now in terms of refraction, light rays that pass through a transparent substance, such as air, and then into another transparent substance with a different density, such as water, or has an ear, the cornea, then the light bends or changes direction at the junction between those two substances. Now this bending is known as refraction. As light rays enter the eye, they are refracted at the anterior and posterior surfaces of the cornea. Similarly, both surfaces of the lens of the eye further refract the light rays so that they converge and come into exact focus on the retina. Images are inverted, i.e. they are turned upside down, and undergo a left-right reversal, i.e. the light from the left side of the object hits the right side of the retina, and the light from the right side of the object hits the left side of the retina. Approximately 75% of the total refraction of light occurs at the cornea, Approximately 75% of the total refraction of the light occurs at the cornea, while the remaining 25% comes from the focusing power of the lens. The lens also changes the focus to view near or distant objects. When an object is more than 6 metres away from the viewer, uh, the light rays reflected from the object are nearly parallel to one another. 
The lens has to bend these light rays just enough so that they fall exactly on the fovea centralis. This is where the vision is the sharpest. When an object is less than six meters away from the viewer, the light rays reflect from the object are divergent, as you can see here. The lens has to bend these light rays. They must be refracted more if they are to fall exactly on the fovea centralis. This additional refraction is accomplished through a process called accommodation. A surface that curves outwards, like a ball, is said to be convex. When the surface of a lens is convex, it will reflect the light rays towards each other so that they converge and eventually intersect. The lens of the eye is convex on both its posterior and anterior surfaces. Its focusing power increases as its curvature increases. When the eye is focused on a close object, the lens becomes more curved, creating a greater refraction of the light rays. This increase in curvature is called accommodation. Accommodation works as follows. When you are viewing distant objects, the ciliary body, as you can see here, is relaxed, and the lens is flatter, as it is stretched in all directions uh, by the taut zonular fibres. When you are viewing close objects, the ciliary muscle contracts, the ciliary body becomes tense, and the zonular fibres slacken, increasing the curvature of the lens, given that the lens is elastic and becomes more curved when relaxed. Photoreceptors, rods and cones. The retina is the photosensitive part of the eye. It has a number of photoreceptors, which are specialized cells that begin the process by which light rays are ultimately converted to nerve impulses. There are two types of photoreceptors, rods, which you can see here in blue, and cones, which you can see here in green. Each retina has about 6 million cones and 120 million rods. Now light must travel through a number of different types of neural cells within the retina before reaching the photoreceptors. Light rays cause chemical changes in the photosensitive pigments in these cells, which then generate nerve impulses, which are conducted back up through the neural cells and transmitted to the occipital lobes, the visual processing center of the cerebrum via the optic nerves. The rods are more sensitive than the cones. They are stimulated by low intensity or dim light. Rods allow you to see in dim light, for example, when you go for a stroll by moonlight. Rods do not provide color vision. Therefore, in dim light, we can only see in black, white, and shades of gray in between. The cones are sensitive to bright light and color. The different wavelengths of visible light stimulate the photosensitive pigments in the cones, resulting in the perception of different colors. Now, brighter light, like going for a stroll in daylight, stimulates the cones, which produces the color vision. There are three types of cones within the retina, red cones, sensitive to red light, green cones, sensitive to green light, and blue cones, which are sensitive to blue light. Now, colour vision comes about as a result of stimulation of the various combinations of these three types of cones. That said, um, that said Snowden et al. 2012 state that the cones are often wrongly called red, green and blue. They should really be called long wave, middle wave and short wave cones, as the so-called red cones are more sensitive to long wave lengths of light, green cones are more sensitive to the middle wave lengths of light, and blue cones are more sensitive to the shorter wavelengths of light. As I said earlier in the presentation, in the center of the posterior portion of the retina is the macula lutea or yellow spot. Now this is an oval shaped pigmented area near the center of the retina, which is responsible for the sharp detailed central vision. In the center of the macula lutea is a small depression known as the fovea centralis, this consists of only cone-shaped photoreceptors 
and is therefore the area with the highest visual resolution or visual acuity. Interestingly though, there are no blue cones in the fovea centralis, only red and green. Photoreceptors are not evenly distributed across the retina. Cones, as we have seen, are concentrated mainly in the central area of the retina called the fovea or the fovea centralis. When you look directly at someone or are reading the words of a textbook, for instance, the image is focused onto the fovea centralis. Now, this slide contains a graph that maps the concentration of the photoreceptors measured in the number of receptors per millimeter squared in relation to the number of degrees away from the fovea centralis. Now, as you can see from this graph, the rods, which are represented by the red dotted line, are completely absent uh, from the fovea and become more densely packed between 12 to 15 degrees into the periphery at the temporal side of the eyeball. The region situated about 12 to 15 degrees on the nasal side of the retina, there are no photoreceptors at all. This is the blind spot. Damage mechanisms. You will be discussing more fully the different types of ultraviolet and infrared radiation later in the non-ionizing radiation imaging and informatics module particularly in respect to safety. That said, you need to be aware of the potential for damage to the eye as a result of UV and infrared radiation. Let's look at ultraviolet radiation. Ultraviolet radiation, UVR, falling onto the eye is absorbed by the cornea and lens. The cornea and conjunctiva, the conjunctiva is a membrane that covers the sclera of the eye, absorb strongly at wavelengths shorter than 300 nanometers. UVC is absorbed in the superficial layers of the cornea and UVB is absorbed by the cornea and lens, whereas UVA passes through the cornea and is absorbed in the lens. Responses of the human eye to acute overexposure of ultraviolet radiation include photokeratitis and photoconjunctivitis, which is inflammation of the cornea and the conjunctiva respectively. More commonly known as snow blindness, arc eye or welder's flash. Symptoms ranging from mild irritation, light sensitivity and tearing to severe pain appear within 30 minutes to a day depending on the intensity of exposure and are usually reversible in a few days. Chronic exposure to UVA and UVB can cause cataracts due to protein changes in the lens of the eye. Very little UV, less than 1% UVA, normally gets through to the retina due to absorption by the anterior issue tissues of the eye. However, there are some people who do not have a natural lens as a result of cataract surgery. And unless there is an implanted artificial lens which absorbs it, the retina can be damaged uh, by UVR at wavelengths as short as 300 nanometers entering the eye. This damage is a result of photochemically produced free radicals attacking the structures of the retinal cells. The retina is normally protected from acute damage by involuntary aversion responses to light, but UVR does not produce these responses. Persons lacking a UVR absorbing lens are therefore at higher risk of suffering retinal damage if working with UVR sources. In terms of IRA, infrared A radiation, now like visible radiation, IRA is also focused by the cornea and lens and transmitted to the retina. There it can cause the same sort of thermal damage as visible radiation can. However, the retina does not detect IRA and so there is no protection from natural aversion responses. The spectral region from 380 to 1400 nanometers, visible and IRA, is sometimes called the retinal hazard region. Chronic exposure to IRA may also induce cataracts. IRA does not have sufficiently energetic photons for there to be a risk of photochemically induced damage. In terms of IRB, 
at wavelengths of about uh, 1,400 nanometers, the aqueous humor um, is a very strong absorber, and longer wavelengths are attenuated by the vitreous humor. Thus, the retina is protected. Heating of the aqueous humor and iris can raise the temperature of the adjacent tissues, including the lens, which is not vascularized, and so cannot control its temperature. This, along with the direct absorption of IRB by the lens, induces cataracts, which may have been an important occupational disease for some groups, principally glass blowers and chain makers. IRC is absorbed by the cornea, and so the main hazard is corneal burns. The temperature in adjacent structures of the eye may increase due to thermal conduction, but heat loss by evaporation and blinking and gain due to body temperature will influence this process. In terms of visible radiation, uh, because the eyes act to collect and focus visible radiation, the retina is at greater risk than the skin. Gazing at a bright light source can cause retinal damage. If the lesion is in the fovea, for example if you are looking directly along a laser beam, severe visual handicap may result. Natural protective measures include an aversion to bright light, the aversion response operates in about 0.25 seconds. The pupil can also contract and reduce the retinal irradiance by about a factor of 30. And also the head may be turned away involuntary. Retinal temperatures, uh, sorry, retinal temperature increases of 10 to 20 degrees Celsius can lead to irreversible damage due to denaturation of the proteins. If the radiation source covers a large part of the field of view so that the retinal image is large, it is difficult for the retinal cells in the central region of the image to shed heat quickly. Visible radiation can cause the same type of photochemically induced damage as UVR, although at visible wavelengths the aversion to bright light can act as a protective mechanism. This effect is most pronounced at wavelengths around 435 to 440 nanometers, and so it is sometimes called the blue light hazard. Chronic exposure to high ambient levels of visible light may be responsible for photochemical damage to the cells of the retina, resulting in poor colour and night vision. Where radiation enters the eye in an essentially parallel beam, i.e. very low divergence from a distant source or a laser, it may be imaged onto the retina in a very small area, concentrating the power tremendously and resulting in severe damage. This focusing process could in theory increase the irradiance on the retina compared to that falling on the eye by up to 500,000 times. In these cases, the brightness can exceed all known natural and man-made light sources. Most laser injuries are burns. Pulsed high peak power lasers can produce such a rapid rise in temperature that cells literally explode. There was an interesting correspondence in the New England Journal of Medicine in 2010 by Versch, uh, Benninger and Schmidt on retinal injuries from a handheld laser pointer. Laser pointers can cause severe eye injury as demonstrated by the case of a 15 year old boy presented in this particular correspondence. The story is that the boy had ordered a handheld laser pointer uh, with green light on the internet. He wanted to use it as a toy for popping balloons from a distance and for burning holes into paper, etc. He was playing with his laser pointer in front of a mirror to create a laser show, during which time the laser beam hit his eyes several times. He noticed immediate blurred vision in both of his eyes. However, he hoped that the visual loss would be transient, as he was afraid of telling his parents. He waited two weeks before seeking an ophthalmic assessment, as he could no longer disguise his bad vision. His visual acuity was so poor in his left eye that he was only able to count fingers at a distance of three feet. A fundoscopic examination revealed a dense subretinal hemorrhage in his left macula, as seen in Figure 1a, and several tiny round scars in the pigment epithelium of the uh, foveola region of his right eye, Figure 1b. The clinical findings were consistent with severe bilateral retinal laser injury. 
So as you can see, the potential for retinal damage by lasers is significant. And further discussion on lasers will be discussed later in the non-ionizing radiation imaging and informatics module. In summary, we have discussed the gross anatomical structure of the eye, the layers and chambers that make up the eyeball and their function, how light enters the eye and is focused on the retina, the functions of the extraocular muscles and the muscles of the iris, the functions of the photoreceptor cells, rods and cones, and we've also described the damage mechanisms to the retina from UV, IR and visible light. Well, that's all for this brief overview of the anatomy of the eye. Um, as you can see here, this is the bibliography of the the main text that we use to construct this presentation, which I would recommend that you uh, have a look at some of these books just to further enhance your knowledge of anatomy of the eye. See you later. Bye bye.